Thanks, Joe. Well, uh, I just want to say uh, again, thank you again for the uh, opportunity to present at uh, EnviroTech. It's been a couple of years and East has done a, a fantastic job, so I just want to make sure that uh, I say a huge thanks to those uh, hardworking folks. Uh, my name is Robert Best. I'm an aquatic biologist and the manager of water resources at Integrated Sustainability. Today, I wanted to speak to you about some of the changes to the Fisheries Act uh, and to really just ask the question, uh, are you covered? So I'd like to provide you with a bit of a brief overview of my presentation today. Uh, we'll try to get through it uh, quickly just so we can try to keep people on, on schedule here. Uh, so first I'll start with um, how we got where we are, some of the major changes to the Fisheries Act, uh, what are letters of advice, and I'm going to finish with a case study uh, to speak uh, about the DFO request for review process. So how did we get here? Well, in November 2015, the Prime Minister mandated uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, as well as the Canadian Coast Guard, to review the previous government's changes to the Fisheries Act and restore what they felt to be lost protections and also incorporate modern safeguards. This eventually included the National Energy Board, which is now the Canada Energy Regulator, and other government ministries. In the fall of 2016, the Government of Canada requested Fisheries and Oceans conduct a study to review the 2012 changes to the Fisheries Act. To support the review, DFO undertook engagement with Canadians and had approximately 70,000 unique visits to the website and also received almost 1,700 written submissions. In February 2017, the report was released and all these background and engagement documents uh, are readily available on the DFO website. In February 2018, the Government of Canada introduced Bill C-68 in order to again restore what they felt were lost protections and incorporate modern safeguards. So royal assent is a process by which a bill becomes an act of Parliament and part of the law in Canada. In June 2019, most of the provisions in Bill C-68 came into force. Some of these provisions include the new purpose of the Act, new Indigenous provisions, and new considerations for decision-making. On the 28th of August, 2019, the new fish and fish habitat protection provisions came into force and replaced the fisheries protection provisions of the pre-Royal Ascent Fisheries Act. So that is how we got to this point in time. One of the most important changes was reverting back to the prohibition against a harmful alteration or disruption or destruction or a had of fish habitat which is designed to provide protection for all fish species and fish habitat. As a result of this amendment, the prohibit prohibition against works, undertakings, or activities causing serious harm to fish that are part of or support a commercial, recreational, or Aboriginal fishery was rescinded. The change to have from serious harm to fish is impactful. However, in my experience, the majority of projects I've been involved with were required to consider potential impacts to all fish species as it was very rare to encounter a fish population that was in no way associated with a CRA fishery. If you think of it plainly, even Brooks stickleback and other less desirable fish species, for example, minnows or suckers, support CRA fisheries as prey species for more flashy specimens, such as trout, walleye, or pike. Some additional changes included, uh, but again, I should say are not limited to, restoring a prohibition against causing the death of fish by means other than fishing, strengthening the role of Indigenous peoples in project reviews, monitoring, and policy development, promoting restoration of degraded habitats, allowing for better management of large and small projects impacting fish and fish habitat through a new permitting framework and code of practices. Uh, some of you may uh, remember DFO operational statements. Uh, they're probably close to 10 years old, at least now. Uh, while not coming back in their uh, same or original format, a code of practices are currently under development uh, and a timeline for their release has not yet been confirmed. There are two code of practices, one of which I will touch on uh, later on in this presentation. Uh, also, provide improved protection of fish and or fish habitats that are sensitive, highly productive, rare, or unique through the designation of ecologically significant areas, consideration of cumulative effects of development activities on fish and fish habitat, and lastly, establish a new requirement to make information on project decisions 
public through an online registry. So in that transitional period between Royal Ascent and coming into force, there were projects submitted to the DFO for review, some of which required project authorizations. This seemingly complicated flowchart provided direction on, fish, on which Fisheries Act was needed to be followed. However, for many proponents with, quote, temporary water intakes, uh, say water intakes that can be removed from the water body relatively easily, compared to something that's uh, more permanent, uh, this didn't provide any direction. That is because proponents of projects that required review, but not a project authorization from the DFO, often received a letter of advice. So what I have up on the screen here is just the first page of, uh, of a standard letter of advice that I've received in the past. So letters of advice are non-regulatory tools currently issued to provide advice to proponents on the implementation of appropriate measures to avoid and mitigate harm to fish and fish habitat to assist them in complying with the Fisheries Act. Proponents are responsible for complying with the Fisheries Act. Letters of advice are typically the end result of standard water withdrawal projects that has undergone a project review by DFO. So typically, the letter of advice would include a high-level description of what the proponent has told the DFO that they plan to do, what information DFO has considered in their review, for example, reports, communications with provincial regulators, et cetera, what mitigations in addition to what the proponent has included are recommended by DFO, a determination of whether the project is likely to cause previously serious harm to fish or now whether there may be a had of fish habitat. If a had is likely, then the DFO reviewer may recommend that the proponent revise the planned activities or apply for project authorization. So letters of advice that were issued prior to coming into force of the fish and fish habitat protection provisions may not adequately protect fish and fish habitat in accordance with the amended Fisheries Act. For example, the quote, serious harm to fish prohibition of the previous Fisheries Act did not actually encompass temporary alterations to habitat. Typically only permanent alterations were considered. The new HAD regime does so by capturing disruption of fish habitat. It is therefore the responsibility of the holders of letters of advice to verify if additional measures should be implemented in order to remain compliant with the Fisheries Act. Therefore, the DFO recommends that proponents have previous letters of advice. When I say previous, I mean pre-August uh, 28, 2019, reviewed by a qualified professional to determine if additional DFO input is required to maintain compliance with the Fisheries Act. Uh, I should note here that no letters of advice are grandfathered. That was a specific uh, statement from DFO. Uh, you can find that on their website as well. So I wanna jump into this case study and I'm gonna focus on Alberta, but um, DFO's mandate is uh, Canada-wide. So uh, you can just uh, swap out, you know, Water Act with Water Sustainability Act if you're interested in British Columbia, um, as well as uh, land, uh, getting uh, permission uh, for land use, crown land or private land, uh, as well as uh, First Nations consultation. So really, uh, what is the process for getting a surface water license approved in Alberta? It breaks down into four basic steps, uh, applying for a Water Act license. This can either be a, a temporary diversion license, a TDL or, a, or term license. Uh, second would be uh, getting access to the land, and that can be through a Public Lands Act application, uh, you know, often it's a, a license of occupation or a temporary field authorization on Crown land. Uh, or if you're on pri private land, you need the written approval from the landowner. Uh, thirdly would be uh, completing First Nations consultation. Uh, typically this is done through the uh, Aboriginal Consultation Office in Alberta. Uh, should your project require a DFO review, uh, they will absolutely ask you if First Nations consultation has been completed as that is now part of their new mandate. And lastly, uh, is determining whether the project needs uh, to be reviewed by the DFO. So for the purpose of this case study, I'm going to assume that the first three items have already been taken care of or are in progress. So let's talk about the DFO request for review process. I've broken it down into five different pieces. Uh, what, is, what is it? Uh, is it required? What is the process? How long can that process take? And what happens if I choose to not submit my project for DFO review? Well, in many cases we've heard, uh, you know, I, I have my approved license from the AER, 
uh, isn't that good enough? Well, unfortunately, uh, the answer is project dependent and often no, having a Water Act license is not enough to maintain compliance with the Federal Fisheries Act. Engagement with your qualified professional towards the beginning of a project will help you understand whether or not the project will require a review by DFO and therefore can be factored into your project schedule to help avoid any unforeseen delays. So it is a process for determining whether a project or specific project activities require review by DFO before commencing. It provides proponents with an opportunity to verify with the DFO that their mitigation measures are appropriate, sufficient, and in compliance with the Fisheries Act. It provides DFO with an opportunity to recommend additional mitigation measures if necessary, or to engage with provincial counterparts to review potential cumulative impacts to reduce the likelihood of a had of fish habitat. It also provides proponents with an opportunity to adjust project activities if a had of fish habitat is expected to avoid needing to apply for an authorization under the Fisheries Act. So we often hear from proponents who are sometimes frustrated that this is a, a quote, double review. You know, while, while we don't necessarily disagree, uh, I've put this question to DFO and AER uh, reviewers and, and really the answers don't fluctuate much. The DFO often reviews with a slightly different lens on ecological flow requirements when compared to the AER. The AER typically relies on the uh, surface water allocation directive, water conservation objectives if they exist on the water body, uh, previously the Alberta desktop method, and also proponent supplied information for the impacts to the aquatic environment. And so the DFO typically relies on proponent supplied information as well, um, in addition to peer reviewed advice found within the framework for assessing the ecological flow requirements to support fisheries in Canada, which is uh, an article that was produced by the Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat uh, of the federal government. So regardless of the recent amendments to the Fisheries Act, the requirement to have a project reviewed or not by DFO really have not changed. Previously, proponents could follow the, the quote, self-assessment process to determine whether their project required a review. However, this has been replaced and the new system uses much of the same information, just really in a different format. The two main considerations to determine whether your project requires a review are, one, does the water body in question require a review? And two, can your project follow all of the measures to protect fish and fish habitat? So the emphasis on all should be noted there as this will come into play a little bit later. So for the first consideration, which is water body specific, a project review by DFO is not required for water bodies that include artificial water bodies that are not connected to a water body that contains fish at any time during any given year. For example, private ponds, roadside drainage ditches, quarries or aggregate pits, irrigation ponds or channels, stormwater management ponds, agricultural drains and drainage ditches, commercial ponds like golf course ponds, or even stocked fishing ponds. Or any other water body that doesn't contain fish at any time during any given year, or isn't connected to a water body that contains fish at any time during any given year. So next we move on to the second criteria, whether your project can avoid all measures to protect fish and fish habitat. If you can follow all the measures to protect fish and fish habitat, you do not need to request a review by DFO. So measures most relevant to water withdrawals from fish bearing water bodies include, and again this list isn't fully a comprehensive list, this is just some of the ones that are most uh, uh, relevant to water withdrawals. So avoid causing the death of fish. Avoid the uh, had a fish habitat in your work, undertaking, or activity. Maintain an undisturbed vegetated buffer between on land activity and the high water mark of any water body. Avoid disturbing or removing materials from the banks, shoreline, or water bed, water body bed. Avoid obstructing or interfering with the movement and migration of fish. So, of those me measures just listed, uh, most are avoidable through proactive project planning. And so continuing on, uh, undertake activity to respect timing windows. So in Alberta, uh, respecting the uh, restricted activity period of, of a particular water body in question. Avoid conducting work 
or undertaking or activity in water. Avoid placing fill or other temporary or permanent structures below the high water mark and avoid changing flow or water level. So this second set uh, are often uh, unavoidable and typically will lead you to requiring a review by DFO. It should be noted that not being able to incorporate any single item off those lists that I just read necessitates a review by DFO as you can no longer incorporate all measures to protect fish and fish habitat. If your project is located on a water body where DFO review is not required, then you don't need to consider whether your project requires a review based on the measures that I just provided, as it doesn't apply. However, if your project is like most proponents who are looking for a reliable uh, surface water source for development activities, then they need to consider their project activities and whether, again, they can incorporate all the measures to protect fish and fish habitat. Incorporating some uh, still requires a review. You need to be able to incorporate them all. So at this point, this is where we come down to an inherent need for DFO reviews on water withdrawals from fish bearing water bodies in Canada. The reason for this is, and I'll restate this, water withdrawals from fish bearing water bodies are often unable to respect the restricted activity period. So if you have uh, year round water withdrawals, if you're going to be placing or repositioning a water intake during the wrap, you can't meet that, uh, that requirement. Uh, Avoid, so the next one would be avoid uh, conducting any work, undertaking or activity in water. Water withdrawals at their core are activities in water. Avoid placing fill or other temporary or permanent structures below the high water mark. Well, this can include the fish screen, water intake designs that rest uh, on the bed that float or a more, more permanent design such as riverbed infiltration galleries or riverbank intakes. And this also uh, includes all project material below the high water mark. So any anchors, hoses, uh, or ropes as well. And lastly, avoid changing uh, flow or water level. So any water withdrawal constitutes a change in flow regardless of the rate, the duration of the withdrawal, and the volume. Therefore, there's an inherent need for all surface water withdrawals, both uh, in Alberta, TDL and term licenses from fish bearing water bodies to be reviewed by DFO to maintain compliance with the Federal Fisheries Act. So this seems to be controversial with different messages coming from different proponents uh, and different consultants, but one message has always been the same from DFO. For any water withdrawal in Canada that is from a fish bearing water body or that is connected to a water body that contains fish at any time during any given year, a review by DFO is required. If you're told your water withdrawal project from a fish bearing water body doesn't require a DFO review, uh, I would recommend you ask why and get it in writing. In the end, it's your responsibility to be compliant with the Fisheries Act. Uh, recently, the AER has actually be, uh, begun to provide feedback related to TDLs from fish bearing water bodies uh, that the proponent must, and I quote, I uh, just got this from a proponent the other day, uh, I quote, request a project near water review from DFO when the works, undertakings, or activities do not meet all the criteria listed in the interim code of practice. And so that was one of the code of practices that I spoke to, uh, spoke about recently. Uh, and so we'll jump into that interim code of practice issued by the DFO. Uh, and under section two, it states that you can use this code of practice if you follow all three conditions in that section. And so one of those three conditions states that you can use the interim code of practice if you incorporate the measures in this code of practice and all other applicable measures to protect fish and fish habitat. So as you can see, from what we just discussed, it is inherently difficult or functionally impossible to meet that condition. And therefore, we get back to the same requirement to have your project reviewed by DFO. So now that we've established that a DFO review is necessary, what is the process for initiating it? First, you complete your DFO request for review form. You can get it on their website. I recommend downloading a new one each time as they update it uh, periodically. This form uh, really should be completed by a qualified professional with past experience. Uh, this will help with the cost effectiveness to your business uh, and efficiency of the review by DFO. Um, it really just helps reduce um, supplemental information requests or needless back and forth with the regulator. And how much uh, information you provide is really based on a number of variables depending on 
the potential impact of project activities, the rate, volume, and duration, or timing of your withdrawals, uh, availability and the quality of the fish habitat, or the sensitivity of the water body in question, and lastly, the, the presence of federal or provincial species at risk. Uh, in Alberta, the submission goes to Central Arctic. In BC, uh, it goes to the Pacific Region Office. So this is, I'm not going to go through the forms in detail, but uh, this is the typical form. Uh, information that's included is your, your typical contact information, uh, basic information about project location, uh, what work categories may apply to your project, uh, description of the aquatic environment, which includes a description of the biological and physical characteristics of the site, potential effects of the proposed project, uh, including whether you're able to incorporate all the measures to protect fish and fish habitat, uh, species presence, including species at risk, avoidance and mitigation measures to avoid any uh, to reduce or avoid any potential impacts on the aquatic environment uh, and uh, additional project specific details so uh, my experience has been for long-term licensing type projects uh, typically uh, having your completed water act application and supplemental documents uh, prepared uh, prior to the submission of the dfo form uh, really helps uh, expedite the, the information that's included in the, the requ request for review form that you see on the screen. Uh, so the timeline for response varies. Um, in Alberta, uh, the, when you submit the form, it goes to, uh, it actually goes to Ontario uh, and is typically reviewed if it requires a project specific review through uh, the office in Manitoba. So uh, when you first submit that form, it goes to the triage department uh, they review it. Uh, you'll typically get a response within uh, 48 weeks for projects uh, submitted in Alberta. Um, that response will tell you whether or not your project requires a project-specific review. Um, if it requires a project-specific review, it's typically another four to eight weeks for that review to actually be conducted uh, by habitat biologists and, uh, and hydrologists as well. Uh, if it doesn't require project-specific review, then that triage department response uh, is uh, is kind of the end of that uh, review process. Uh, one thing that I have found is that uh, recent experience with COVID-19 uh, and DFO staff having intermittent access to servers is the timelines, you know, you're looking at one and a half to two times that, uh, that normal timeline. Um, and it should also be noted that there are, there are no regulated timelines for the DFO review process, uh, unlike authorization. So I would recommend that you engage a qualified professional early in the process uh, to limit the impact to schedule. So currently the AER is planning inspections on sensitive water bodies in areas with a history of non-compliance. Um, the AER has released a bulletin recently where they've uh, indicated that there, there's been a number of non-compliance uh, from proponents uh, on the water bodies in Alberta. So they have inspections planned and, uh, and I think currently underway for the spring and upcoming summer of 2020. DFO is actually in communication with provincial regulators uh, and they're looking to potentially coordinate on an inspection blitz. Uh, DFO typically doesn't have a big presence on water bodies in Alberta, but uh, my understanding is that is uh, about to change. And so the worst case scenario would be, you know, a non-compliance with the Federal Fisheries Act and Species at Risk Act, damage to your social license and areas uh, that you do business, uh, and corporate and per personal liability for fines per day. Uh, as well as possible imprisonment, which is unlikely, but fines are definitely um, a tool that is used for regulatory compliance. And it should also be noted that each day uh, a non-compliance occurs is considered a new occurrence and, uh, and fines can, can be significant. So DFO uh, has also opened discussions with the province to reduce the need for this quote double review. Uh, however, uh, I've been told it will not be a formal agreement uh, and little progress has been made to this, uh, this point in time. Uh, so how much and how long do they take to, to complete? So it really depends on the experience of the qualified professional completing the work, um, the availability of project information, the quality of publicly available data, uh, whether a field program is necessary, uh, and whether what the potential project activities or design of the water intake infrastructure is. Um, you know, with a reasonable but, uh, but amount of information available, um, you know, we've seen costs of around $1,500 to start. Um, typically, these forms can be filled in uh, pretty quickly uh, by experienced professionals. 
uh, and turnaround uh, should be uh, sometimes as little as a day. Uh, where additional information is required to be collected, then obviously the timeline for completion may be impacted. So, you know, we've prepared, submitted, and received approval for over 20 term licenses in Alberta and BC. You know, we, we, we've had the opportunity to be in close contact with the provincial and federal regulators. You know, my recommendation to everybody, whether it's uh, consultants or, or um, proponents that we do business with, you know, pick up the phone, uh, ask the questions, and uh, get second opinions if necessary, because, you know, the Fisheries Act has changed, uh, and I just want to make sure that you guys are covered. And so that uh, that ends my presentation for today. Uh, thank you very much, Joe and Issa, for uh, for having me today. And I'd uh, welcome any questions. Uh, you're welcome to give me a call or email or uh, through this forum as well. Well, uh, thank you so much, Robert. Uh, thank you, Integrated, uh, for doing this today. I really appreciate it. Um, I have one question here, uh, just for everyone. Yes, the slides will be available. They'll be available um, at the end. Everyone will get um, an email at the conclusion uh, late Friday or over the weekend with links. Um, where can I find the self-assessment document is one of the questions. Yeah, so the, the self-assessment process has been removed. It was uh, something under the previous Fisheries Act. Um, and when I say that, the term self-assessment has disappeared. If you uh, if you just go to Google, you can type in DFO and projects near water. The projects near water website through the DFO uh, has a I believe it's a six step process um, that will walk you through and uh, and so the, uh, the all the measures to uh, protect fish and fish habitat uh, are included there. The the list that I gave are most relevant to water withdrawals, but again, there's um, there's other water bodies, there's other uh, project activities that can be excluded from the review process but water withdrawals in Canada uh, unfortunately are not excluded from the DFO review process. Okay great um, since we're short on time and sorry Robert we uh, ran out of time for questions um, and we have another webinar starting in a couple minutes I'm going to end this one and we're going to get the other one set up and um, we'll we'll get it going so thank you for all the presenters in our first stream on regulatory updates Really appreciate everyone's time and efforts. Uh, be back online in a couple of minutes. Thank you.